toasters kill more people than sharks. My sister-in-law Beth said this. I saw my wife roll her eyes at Beth's statement. No, really. I read online that more than 150 people died in toaster-related accidents last year. That same year, only three people died from shark attacks. There is nothing more dangerous in the Army than a newly minted second lieutenant with a map and compass. In civilian life, people with high-speed internet connections and free time pose the greatest threat to society today. Sometimes a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Beth, my brother's wife, lives next door. Now she is in our kitchen, trying to get my small school-aged children to eat breakfast with her children before school. As most parents know, the morning school routine is like herding cats. Kindergarten kids are wearing those stupid old t-shirts that say, too ugly to die. My wife received a bunch of these t-shirts from an Eastern European anesthesiologist she worked with at the hospital. So, both my wife and I love our daughter-in-law, Beth. She is a good wife to my younger brother, William. They are made for each other. As different as my brother, William, and I are, our wives are just as different. At school, I could barely walk around the edge. I mainly liked the sports side of school. I played football, wrestled, and even boxed a little. Because I was short, I wasn't very good. But my strong physique, as well as the stubborn streak inherited from my southern Greek parents, served me well. Meanwhile, my younger brother William was doing well at school. William was a member of the National Honor Society, the Chess Club, and received numerous scholarships. The very next day after leaving school, I joined the Merchant Navy, served for several years and saved some money. Now I have a small contracting business, mainly in the construction and improvement of houses. William is a professor. He received his PhD in the work of the poet Basil Buntings. William teaches at the local university and seems to be respected by his colleagues. I met my wife in the emergency room when I responded to a construction accident. My wife is a woman without quirks, with a sarcastic sense of humor and a realistic outlook on life. My brother William's wife, Beth, is a kindergarten teacher. Beth is the nicest woman. The fact that they live next to us is a real bonus. I know she wants the best for my brother William and their two children. However, let's just say that Beth is a little naive and lives in an ivory tower. Today, Beth went on a rant about how dangerous toasters are. I poured myself some coffee. Beth, if toasters are more dangerous than sharks, then, logically, a shark with a toaster is the worst threat on the planet. Beth placed a plate of bacon in front of my son and looked at me. My little son took a bite of bacon, then spat it out. Aunt Beth, this bacon doesn't taste good. Beth stroked his head. This is tofu bacon. It doesn't have any of that disgusting, chemical-laden meat in it. Meat is responsible for every tenth death. Naturally, I couldn't resist the obvious answer. If meat is responsible for one in ten deaths, does that mean tofu, fruits and vegetables are responsible for the other nine? My wife reached into my son's plate, then popped a piece of tofu back on into her mouth. She made a face before swallowing. Beth, it's easier to change a person's religion than his diet. Beth just sighed and then clapped her hands. Okay, kids, it's time to go to school. Everything is in a Prius. I grabbed my youngest son and his cousin in a bear hug. Sit and enjoy your visit, Beth. I'll take the children to school. Beth waved her hand. No, it's okay, Ron. I don't want you wasting gas on your big truck. Children will fit in a Prius. I threw the giggling boys over my shoulder and onto my back. Beth, I run my own homemade biodiesel, so don't worry. I threw both boys into the air before catching them. How about we let the boys decide? I lowered the children to the ground and knelt in front of them. What do you say, men? Want to ride in an Aunt Beth hybrid that spews kittens and butterflies from the exhaust? Then I lowered my voice a few octaves to a growling baritone. Or want to take a ride in a manly, testosterone-dripping, smoke-belching, tire-squealing, menacing, powerful, Ford F-250 extended cab pickup with a power stroke engine and enough torque to pull a house down the street. Truck, 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 the children chanted, jumping up and down. I want a Testron, too. My youngest son picked up. I hugged all the giggling children. Sorry, Beth, the masses have spoken. Both my wife and Beth smiled as I ushered the kids out the door. 
lugging backpacks with various cartoon themes behind me. Leaving the children at school, I went home. Today was a paperwork day with bills, orders, payroll, etc. to deal with, so I'll be working from my home office above the garage. I was heading to the kitchen from the garage when I heard my wife's voice. Oh, Beth, I could never do that to Ron. I know that eavesdropping on private conversations is impolite, but damn, this is my home. Silently, I moved closer to the door in order to catch what Beth had to say. This wouldn't have been published in Cosmo if it weren't true. His tricks will help you spice up your time in the bedroom. I heard my wife answer, Beth, I don't need any tricks in the bedroom. Yes, of course. But don't you want to excite Ron? The wife replied, Ron is a guy. To excite a guy, all you have to do is take off your socks. Beth didn't let her finish. Okay. But how do you make Ron scream with passion? My wife snorted before speaking. I definitely don't want my boyfriend to scream during passion or at any other time. The only time my man should scream in the bedroom is if a stray bullet flies through the window and hits him in the ass while we're having sex. Beth continued. Well, at least you should know what words to say to Ron so that he actually gets great sex. At that moment, I walked through the door. Both Beth and my wife looked up. Taking a look at them, I raised my hand in a closed fist. Beth, let me tell you about what guys require for great sex. I raised one finger. Number one, want a woman. I raised a second finger. Number two, a woman must want. I added a third finger. Number three, don't talk. Shh. My wife just grinned, but Beth said, Ron, not all men are like that. Take your brother William, for example. Beth, do you want me to take a cue from the guy who let his wife put diesel in their gas-powered hybrid? Prius? Beth looked confused for a moment, remembering how I had to tow them home. Then there's the hassle of draining the fuel tank and restoring the Prius's functionality. Ron, it wasn't our fault. The diesel fuel dispenser was painted green. We both thought this meant the fuel was environmentally friendly. I shook my head. Beth, how the hell did you even get that big diesel gun into the filler neck of a Prius? Now it was Beth's turn to smirk. Ron, women are experts at making big things fit into small holes. We women simply know our bodies better. For example, women can climax simply from exercises. I shrugged. Big deal. Men can experience climax just by watching women play sports. Stop it, Ron, Beth said. But I'm glad you're here. I can't decide what to get William for his birthday. A cooking set he had his eye on, or a sweater we saw in the university store. No, Beth, forget about this stuff, I said. Let me tell you what William really wants. Beth leaned forward. What? Tell me, Ron, please. It's a well-known secret, Beth. The best gift you can give William. I paused for dramatic effect. This is to satisfy him by caressing his manhood. Beth blushed and I continued. It's always in fashion. It's just our size. We can never have enough. Never get tired of it. It always fits. We can always take another one. It's exactly what we wanted. It's never too late for another one. It's perfect for any occasion and goes with everything. All in all, the perfect gift. My wife stifled a yawn. Okay, you two, go your separate ways. She cleared the dishes from the table into the sink. I came from the night shift at the ambulance. She pointed at me. You, Ron, go do your paperwork. And you, Miss Cosmo, sex counselor? She pointed at Beth. Go bake some erotic cookies for your hubby, William. It was one of those wonderful Friday nights that all married men dream of. My wife worked the night shift at a hospital. The kids were away at some scout camp, so I had the whole house to myself. Plus, my favorite sports team was playing on TV. Could life be any better? Leroy, my neighbor, sat in an easy chair while we enjoyed the game. We had fun, alternately praising and cursing the judges' decisions. You see, Leroy is a strange guy. He is gay and the first openly gay person I know well. However, Leroy does not fit the stereotype of a homosexual at all. Leroy works as a fireman and is the blackest black man I have ever seen. The damn guy is also the biggest one I've ever met. 
With a height of 2 meters 8 centimeters, he weighs more than 113 kilograms. And this is not fat. Leroy and I bonded over our shared love of Ford Power Stroke diesel trucks and devotion to a local sports team. You know, Leroy, I said, handing him another can of beer. Perhaps you gays are right about something. There was a pause as we both protested an obvious foul by the opposing team. I opened my beer before continuing. I even envy your lifestyle, Leroy. The refrigerator is stocked with beer, the toilet seat can be left up, and the TV is always tuned to ESPN. Hell, if it weren't for sex with guys, I'd be gay. Leroy smiled before stuffing a huge handful of chips into his mouth. Damn it, Ron, you could never be gay. I shrugged as the TV showed some commercials. What do you mean, Leroy? I can be gay too. There must be some website or something I could go to. Is it really that difficult? Leroy shook his head and assumed a solemn pose. Then, in a deep voice similar to Darth Vader, Leroy said, You poor heterosexual bastard, you will never understand the ways of my people. He spread his arms. God loved us gays so much that he created many, many of us. Damn, Leroy, I always thought there were so many gays that you guys could redecorate the earth. We both giggled, and then the house phone rang. I was going to ignore him. Most people who call me use my mobile phone. We still have a landline at home, mostly as a backup. Infrequent power outages have killed our cell service too often. However, it could have been one of the camp teachers, so I picked up the phone. Before I could say hello, a sad cry hit my ear. The voice was Beth, my sister-in-law, but it was hard to make out anything through the crying and wailing. Ron, you have to help me. I was arrested. That was all I heard before the plaintive cry was heard again. Beth? Beth, is it you? I asked, interrupting the crying coming from the receiver. You need to calm down. I can't understand a word of what you're saying. I think you said you were under arrest. Take a deep breath and slow down. The sobbing slowed for a second. Then Beth's voice came back. Uneven but at least I could understand it. Ron, I'm locked up in Metro Prison. It's a big mistake. They think I'm a prostitute. They're going to charge me with prostitution. Beth burst into sobs again. Prostitution! I repeated the phone. Leroy's ears perked up as he grabbed the remote control and turned off the screaming TV. Beth, calm down. Where is William? Beth sobbed. I don't know where he is. William doesn't answer calls. Ron, you have to come and help me out. I swear, this is all a big mistake. My call is about to be interrupted. Please, Ron, please, quicker. The line went dead, and I stared at the phone in shock. After a moment, I explained the situation to Leroy as best I could. Leroy took out his cell phone and started scrolling through phone numbers. Listen, Ron, one of the guys on my gay league softball team is an officer at Metro Prison. Let me contact him. Maybe he can help. Do you have your own softball league? Leroy didn't look up as he dialed a number on his phone. Yes, Ron, we gays have our own league. What? Do you think we spend all our free time having sex? I looked at Leroy shyly. Well, something like that. I mean, I know that you have a gay pride parade every year, but... Leroy waved his hand at me to shut up and began talking on the phone. After a few minutes, Leroy ended the call. Okay, Ron, we have a break. My friend knows the staff who are on duty today. He will arrange for Beth to be taken to a secluded corner and the paperwork put aside until we arrive. Let's go. I'll drive. We both stood up as Leroy took the car keys out of his pocket. Is Beth selling her ass? He shook his head. This must be some kind of screw-up. She and your brother are good people. This lady has a heart of gold. Remember when I first moved in, Beth brought me something to welcome me to the area? Despite the situation, I laughed at the memory. As I recall, Leroy, Beth brought you fried chicken, watermelon, and a large bottle of grape soda. Leroy smiled at me as we headed towards the door. Yes, Ron, but Beth didn't do it out of meanness. She may be ignorant, but there is not an evil bone in this girl. I turned off the lights in the house. I know, Leroy. Beth never knew any black people growing up. When you moved, she went online to find out what to bring you. Leroy nodded as we got into his car. 
That's what I mean, Ron. They don't make people like Beth anymore. Let's go save my favorite white lady and settle everything. Even with Leroy's connections, it took us several hours to get Beth out of jail. Now we were driving home, Beth sitting in the back seat and calming down a little. Leroy and I tried to keep a calm face as Beth told her story for the fourth time. It was just role play, Beth said, trying to touch up the mascara that, after all her crying, made her look like a raccoon. Cosmo says that all couples should feel free to allow their partners to participate in each other's fantasies. Leroy kept his eyes on the dark road and shook his head. You hetero whites have too much free time. I glanced at Beth through the rearview mirror, a passing headlight illuminating her enough to show her embarrassment. Beth was wrapped in Leroy's old T-shirt from the trunk of his car. The T-shirt was so big that Beth swam in it. Given her small stature, Beth could use a T-shirt as a blanket. The T-shirt was necessary because when Beth was arrested, she was only wearing a hip-length coat. Damn Cosmo is turning all you women into sluts, I muttered. Beth spoke as she dialed a number on her cell phone. Damn it, Ron. It is not my fault. This cop got it all wrong. Of course, Beth. You show up at a famous pickup bar wearing nothing but a trench coat. Then you invite an undercover cop to come out to your car in the parking lot and join you in the back seat. Well, what could go wrong? Here, Leroy interjected. Don't forget that she charged him $20. Beth's voice took on a whiny tone. I'm telling you that everything was wrong. William and I were supposed to meet in that bar. I accidentally locked my keys and purse in the car. I tried to convince the bartender to let me use the phone. Then this guy, whom I didn't know was a police officer, asked what I needed. He misunderstood when I said I needed to grab something from the back seat. I meant where my purse and cell phone were in the car, not what he was thinking. I glanced at Leroy and saw that we were both losing the battle to contain our giggles. Beth, what about the $20 you were going to take from him? Beth started to get upset. Stop it, you two. I didn't demand $20 from this man for sex. He asked, how much? I thought that he wanted money to open the door of my car. So I said, $20. Because that's what I gave the AAA traffic guy the last time this happened. I started laughing so hard that tears came out of my eyes, but Leroy had better control over himself. I understand, Beth. These things should happen all the time. Undoubtedly, this is the main reason why innocent people end up in prison. Then he started laughing, too. I don't know how Leroy kept the car on the road. It's not funny, Beth insisted. It was all terrible. It was like I was trapped in some terrible movie. I wish it was the Wizard of Oz, I said, wiping tears from my face. You could ask a wizard to give you brains, like the Scarecrow. Beth tried to ignore our teasing by focusing on her cell phone. Why doesn't William answer his calls? Beth was indignant, closing the phone. I will kill this husband of mine. Leroy dropped us off in front of Beth's house. We didn't even get to the front door when a tow truck pulled up. Sitting on the platform with two flat tires on the driver's side was my brother William's Prius and what appeared to be some minor damage to the front bumper. William got out of the tow truck on the passenger side. William's face looked haggard, but it wasn't his face I was looking at. You see, my brother William was fully dressed in a sailor's suit complete with bell-bottoms. Since Beth and William had never been closer to the ship than bouncy chairs in their pool, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Seeing each other, William and Beth ran towards each other. Having come together, they began to hug, as if this was a meeting after not just a few hours, but several years. As I helped the tow truck driver lower William's Prius into the driveway, I could hear Beth and William talking between their kisses. Drove off the road, dodging a squirrel. I was so worried. The search, the handcuffs, dead cell phone battery, took forever to find the phone. The charges were dropped. The car is still at the bar. I couldn't call because I don't know your number. I always dial by name. I shook my head, looking between the hugging and kissing relatives and the damaged Prius. The tow truck driver came up to me and took off his gloves. Hey, buddy, he said, handing me a board with a clamp. Can you sign this? 
You're related, aren't you? Yes, he is my brother, I muttered, signing the forms and handing them to him. Twenty dollar bill. But I'm wondering if it's too late to ask my mom to do a DNA test. A few months later, it was evening, and Leroy was helping me install a set of bully dog chips into my Ford Power Stroke. My wife looked into the garage. Ron, your brother William just called. He and Beth need your help at their home for a few minutes. As the family's jack-of-all-trades, I'm used to these types of calls about clogged drains, leaky faucets, and the like. This is a bit of a compromise since William and Beth always took our kids on trips that involved more than monster truck rallies. At first I thought that the children would be bored if they were dragged to things like the university exhibition on the Middle Ages. But Beth knows the kids, and they always come back raving about the armor and the cool collection of swords and battle axes. It was a clever way to get them to learn. Leroy decided to accompany me as I walked to William's house. Beth met us at the door in a short night robe. Candles were burning in the living room and a fire was blazing in the fireplace. Leroy, ever the fireman, raised his eyebrows at the open flame. Beth blushed a deeper smelling robe. It's our date night. We just finished decorating and bought all new furniture for the living room. Cosmo says we should... I waved Beth away. Yes, 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 I know. Cosmo said that you should bring ponies, handcuffs, and trapeze into your personal life. How are you? Where is William? William is upstairs. We heard strange sounds coming from the attic. I called you because I don't want William to face whoever is up there alone. Leroy turned to the door. Ron, you go with William. I'll look outside to see if there's any sign of forced entry or break-in. I found William crouching under the attic hatch. In one hand, he had a flashlight with four large LR-14 batteries. In the other, a golf club. There was a knocking noise coming from the attic periodically. Leroy returned and joined us. Guys, I saw a small hole gnawed in the outer screen of the attic. Looks like a squirrel has climbed into the attic. It's better to let her find a way out. He looked at his wristwatch, which seemed tiny on his huge wrist. We can buy a trap in the morning if the animal is still there. The hardware store is closed now. Beth peeked out from behind the steps, ready to run as if a rodent was about to burst through the ceiling, and said, William, can't you guys get rid of him? He scares me. William turned to us and then said in a low voice, Can we do something? He nodded his chin towards Beth. She won't relax if that thing is prowling around. Beth loves these date nights. Do you know what I mean? Ten minutes later, the massive Leroy was walking up the attic stairs, a gunny bag in one hand and a battery-powered flashlight in the other. I was behind him on the stairs. William was standing at the bottom of the stairs. Beth was still in her position at the end of the stairs in the hallway. Leroy had just poked his head into the attic and was shining a flashlight around when the furry face of a squirrel appeared in the flashlight's beam. Leroy cried out in surprise as he and the squirrel found themselves face to face, just a few centimeters from each other. Then everything went to hell. Leroy tried to cover the squirrel with a matting bag. The squirrel jumped into Leroy's hair. Leroy dropped the burlap and flashlight to brush the rodent off his head. I was momentarily blinded when the bag fell on my face. William had it much worse. A large lantern hit him squarely on the bridge of his nose and then rolled over into his left eye. Things got worse when Leroy lost his balance and fell on top of me. We both fell down the stairs, landing on top of William in a heap on the floor. Then came Beth's blood-curdling scream as the squirrel circled around us, jumped over Beth's legs, and down the stairs into the living room. We unstuck ourselves from the pile and rushed to the stairs, just in time to see the squirrel run in a panic towards the fireplace and then jump out with its tail flaming to hide under Beth's new couch. The first, for all his size, was Leroy to go down the stairs. He turned the sofa, which was now on fire, upside down. I was right behind him. We grabbed the throne pillows and began to chase the wild flaming squirrel around the living room, frantically knocking down small lights in its tracks. Finally, Leroy managed to put the animal out of its misery and stop its burning with a strategically placed pillow, suffocating the flaming creature. Then... When I thought it couldn't get any worse, 
Hysterical Beth screamed, Sofa! My sofa! Leroy and I turned to face the flames jumping from the overturned couch. William! I shouted to my stunned brother. Open this damn window! I pointed to the large panoramic window in the living room. Leroy and I grabbed the edge of the sofa, which was not yet on fire. William, blood streaming from his nose, froze in place, one eye already beginning to swell. The flames from the sofa set my hair on fire. William, now! We have to get this couch out of here! I shouted to my brother. William snapped out of his stupor, grabbed a large brass lamp, and threw it at the large window, which created a large hole, and the glass shattered. Once, two, three, quit, Leroy shouted as we threw the flaming furniture out the window. It flew through a broken window, landed momentarily to crush Beth's rose bushes, and then exploded into a flaming mass of splinters on the front lawn. Suddenly everything was silent, only the burning sofa crackled on the lawn. Leroy took out his mobile phone and started calling some numbers. I looked back to make sure there were no more sparks. Beth looked around the room, huge burn marks on the new carpet, pillows blackened by pieces of fried squirrel and soot on the walls. The front window had remnants of broken glass around the edges of the frame. Beth covered her eyes with both hands and began to sob uncontrollably. William put his hand on my shoulder, leading me to the door. I saw his bloody nose and swollen eye in the glow of the flickering fire from the sofa. William smiled at me with a half-smile that showed irritation and said, Ron, I really want to thank you, but I just, I just, I can't, I really, I just can't. Several months have passed since the incident we now call the Great Squirrel Hunt and BBQ. Using my connections in the construction industry, I was able to find Beth and Williams a replacement large glass window within a few days. The insurance company naturally played its games, delaying the consideration of the claim, and, in general, simply played for time before paying for the replacement of furniture. This evening, my wife and I were at home having our own date night. For my wife, who just graduated 12 o'clock shift in the ER, which meant she lay down on the living room couch, watched a movie on the DVD player, put her feet on my lap while I needed her souls. Any wise husband knows that diamonds can be a girl's best friend, but if you want to score some husband points, rub her feet. Judging by the pleased sounds my wife made as I massaged her feet, I was sure that I would be making the same pleased sounds in our bedroom later that evening. William and Beth invited us to skydive as part of a team training session run by William's school department. I had no desire to throw myself out of a perfectly serviceable plane, but it amused me that I could persuade my wife to do so. Come on, honey, I said without stopping, caressing her legs. Just once. Even an idiot tries something once. The wife answered without opening her eyes. Yes, Ron, idiots try everything once. That's why they are idiots. Now if we were... Suddenly the front door burst open and a hysterical Beth burst into our living room. She held the hands of my crying nephews. I was shocked by her appearance. She was balancing in her shoes on ten centimeters stiletto heels. She was wearing a long platinum blonde wig, reaching to her shoulders, and she was wearing only a tiny red thong with glitter. Two sticks with tassels barely covered her breasts, and Beth's entire body was covered in gold sparkles. Beth looked like she had just stepped off a stripper pole. Ron, the house is burning, Beth screamed. You must come to help. William is locked in the bedroom. I stood up so quickly that the movement knocked my wife off the couch. She fell to the floor, landing on her back. Reaching out to Beth, I pulled both crying children from her grasp. Then he turned to his wife but she had already rushed to the phone and dialed 911. I threw the still-crying kids onto the couch and then turned to face Beth. Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, Beth. I'll get William out of there. Do you know where the fire started? Where has it spread? Beth was almost hysterical. Ron, what does this mean? We must save William. I was already heading towards the door, hopping on one leg trying to put on my shoes. Beth, please calm down. 
I need to know where the fire started so I can figure out how to get into the house. Are the doorways and stairs clear? Beth followed me as I ran out of the house, seeming to force herself to calm down. Ron, it all started in the bedroom. I did the striptease I learned at Cosmo and knocked over some candles. The curtains caught fire. I tried to put them out, but William shouted at me to grab the boys and get out. I got to my truck and opened the cab to get the fire extinguisher I kept there. Beth, are the stairs clear? How did you get the kids out? Beth walked behind me in her fuck-me-right-here-in-hard stilettos, still trying to control herself. I don't remember, Ron. There was smoke all around us as we ran down the stairs. Damn, I muttered, opening the garage door to take the ten-foot ladder. I turned and almost collided with Beth, who was right behind me. Beth, stay here. Ron, I can't stand around and do nothing. Beth pointed to her window on the second floor. My husband is there. I saw that it was about to flare up again. I pushed Beth towards the street and said, We don't have time for this crap. Get your lucky ass to the curb, Nemital Wellnabout. I used a fire extinguisher to break the window in my brother William's bedroom. It was small, good for kitchen fires and the like, but it was better than nothing. With only a few cuts, I flew into a room filled with smoke. I kept my head down, holding the fire extinguisher in my hand, trying to find William and the source of the smoke. William, I shouted, immediately regretting it as my lungs filled with smoke and I started coughing. Then I heard William's voice. Ron, 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 get out of here. William's voice came from their four-poster bed in the corner. I crawled over to her and stuck my head out from behind the mattress. William was lying on the bed, naked, and... Lord Jesus Christ, both of his wrists were handcuffed to the headboard posts. William coughed, turning his head towards me. Ron, get out of here. I tried to hide my shock. Yes, of course, William, and let my mother kick my ass again, like when I was a child, for leaving you. Never. Where are the keys to the handcuffs, Houdini? On the edge of the chest of drawers, William said, coughing and pointing with his chin and foot, stumbling through the smoke. I headed towards the chest of drawers, but tripped over something and fell, crashing into the chest of drawers. I watched it in horror as the key fell from the dresser to the floor, bounced once, and then slid into the hole in the heating grate. Son of a bitch! I shouted as the key made its way to the stove in the basement. Smoke filled my lungs, reminding me not to take deep breaths. Crawling back onto Williams's bed, I began to tug at the handcuffs attached to one of the bedposts. Ron, where is the key? William coughed at me. The smoke became so thick that I could no longer see his face clearly. There's a problem with that, William. Are there any more keys? I said, tightening the handcuffs tighter. The damn bed was solid oak, I know, because I helped William lug it piece by piece up the stairs. No, Ron, now get out of here. William tried to push me off the bed with his feet. No need, big brother. Take care of Beth and my boys. My shoulders tensed, and I felt the veins bulge in my forehead as I pulled on the cuff. Take care of Beth yourself, I said, gritting my teeth. You know that my wife will not allow me to have a harem. I thought I felt a slight jolt at the head of the bed as I was overcome by a coughing fit. The next moment I realized that I was lying on the floor, trying to get up, but my body refused to move. I felt warm and then my vision started to become blurry. I tried to get up, but reality was disappearing. So this is how it will end, I thought. I know that my wife will take care of our children. I hope she will be happy. My body began to rise. I saw a bright light approaching me. Damn it. I knew what it meant. I was not ready to leave and would fight St. Peter himself at the gates of heaven or hell. I tried to struggle when a deep voice filled my ears. Relax, Ron. Now I have you. Everything will be fine. I'm taking you away from here. You did well. Relax. Get away. I hit with all my strength and hit something hard. Now I was confused. When did the Grim Reaper get an earthly body? Ugh, son of a bitch. Ron, that hurts. Suddenly cool air washed over my face as something was placed on my face. The deep voice continued, Calm down before I kick you and that puny truck of yours. 
I recognized this voice. I opened my eyes and saw Leroy's face. He held me in his arms like a child. His oxygen mask was on my face. William. William. I croaked, not sure if Leroy understood since he kept his mask on my face. Leroy understood what I wanted and turned us to face the bed. William's bedroom was filled with firefighters in colorful gear. The bright lights on their helmets cut through the smoke. One firefighter was working on William, who was also wearing a firefighter's mask, supplying oxygen. Another started up a chainsaw and began sawing through the head of the bed, to which one of the handcuffs was attached. Two other firefighters pulled a hose through the window and quickly brought the fire under control. The chainsaw roared as it sawed through the first headboard post. As the firefighter began to move to the second handcuff support, the chainsaw stopped with a growl. After a few seconds, he turned to Leroy. The damn thing jammed again! Leroy threw me over one shoulder as if I were weightless. I saw him grab a fire axe from one of his colleagues. In Leroy's massive paw, it looked like a small hatchet. Move! Leroy barked at the men gathered around William's bed. Like Paul Bunyan of old, Leroy swung the fire axe in a mighty arc. In just two blows, the post with the remaining handcuff fell like a sapling. Handing over the axe, Leroy walked to the window and handed me through the window to the waiting paramedic. The entire time I sat on the edge of the fire truck, sucking oxygen, my wife was next to me. We waited for the ambulance to arrive because, despite my protests, my wife was going to take me to the hospital. She made sure I understood it wasn't a request. A sizable crowd had gathered, attracted by fire trucks, lights, and sirens. I saw that Beth was wearing a coat over her stripper outfit. She shifted from foot to foot, trying to keep an eye on her bedroom window while being held back by a police officer providing crowd control. When Leroy climbed out of the bedroom window, the large gathering of our neighbors erupted in loud cheers, and some began clapping. Leroy came down the stairs with William slung over his shoulder. William was as naked as the day he was born, with handcuffs hanging from both wrists that still had pieces of the wooden headboard posts attached to them. Judging by the number of flashes, it seemed that everyone below was recording this moment on their mobile phones to later post on Facebook and YouTube. I had no doubt that soon there would be much more information about William on the Internet than he would like. As a result, both William and I were left under observation and were released the next day. William's house was not too badly damaged, although the bedroom had to be gutted, but everything else was mostly damaged by smoke and water. We all love William and Beth, but I can't tell you how relieved I was when I saw a big stack of Cosmo magazines on the curb the next day of trash pickup. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.